sponsor Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program, we have Toadies. I had a chance to interview uh, D- uh, Donnie Blair, uh, their longtime bassist since 2008. Uh, and we had such a great freaking chat. Um, I really enjoyed chatting with uh, Donnie and getting to uh, to know him, his entrance into the band, uh, their story, really their, uh, how they came about. Uh, you know, performing Rubberneck in uh, in its entirety on tour and the challenges and uh, and over, I think they overcame with that and you know in bringing it out on tour, uh, which is really cool. Um, they also, uh, you know, we talked about their big hit uh, Possum Kingdom, which uh, uh, which was really cool. So I, I um, last weekend I took the kids. Um, on a little getaway, we went out to Berkeley and um, stayed uh, at a hotel there. Went down to the marina, uh, just got away and uh, enjoyed get, uh, getting out, swimming at the um, hotel pool, and um, and they had pelotons there. And I love uh, love me a good peloton, and even me even when I'm away from home, can't really get away from it, right? Uh, if it's there, I'm going to uh, you know I'm going to indulge. So. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, when I was at the hotel, look, I mean, looking at the Peloton, I was like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is really cool. They, uh, they had a ride and the, the, the ride actually had, um, a toady song on it. Uh, see if I can pinch it, pinch in here, uh, uh, to it. Yeah. It, the, it had Possum King Kingdom, um, on the ride. So of course I was like, got to do that ride. And I know it doesn't, uh, have the like button like there. Um, I did like it. So, uh, it, you know, it, I liked that it was a part of the ride as well, which is really cool. You right after I interviewed Toadies. Um, that was a lot of fun to, uh, to have a little getaway. What else is going on right now? Uh, let's see. I went to a comedy show with my buddy Jay last night. I went to see Ken Jong and Joel McHale in Lincoln, California, where, uh, you know, for half the time they razz the town uh, for its location. Um, another quarter of the time they, uh, they, you know, mess with the sign language interpreters and had them say dirty things. And for the last quarter of the, uh, the time, they brought out a, uh, a special guest, um, which was, you know, totally odd. Uh, they, uh, they brought out Robin Thicke. Uh, and they played a couple of songs with uh, with Robin Thicke, so that was that was interesting. Um, and, uh, and it was a fun show, though. It was fun. Um, I I haven't gone to a comedy show in a long time, so uh, I wasn't expecting to see them both perform together, but they did. And uh, you know, I had a couple of drinks beforehand. It made the show a little bit more funny than it probably was, and I had a good time with my buddy Jay. Um, last thing uh, that I have to update is the uh, situation in my house. So um, I have a, uh, yeah, I moved recently, right? And, uh, and I have a four bedroom house that, uh, that I purchased. One of the bedrooms uh, is dedicated solely to my daughter's rabbit that is a part-time uh, pet here at my house. I did not buy her the rabbit. Uh, I, the rabbit was you know, an idea from her mom, and but uh, my daughter did not do well with uh, with taking care of a lizard that she had, you know, a handful of years ago. Uh, that didn't work out too well. So I, uh, I guess my daughter earned the chance to have a rabbit by picking up dog poop at, uh, at her mom's house consistently. And for whatever reason, that got put onto me to be responsible for, to buy supplies for, to have in my house, and apparently to dedicate a room to because there's not enough room in my daughter's room to uh, for a rabbit to exist. So the ra- the, uh, <laughs> the room on the other side of this wall is the rabbits. Uh, well, seemingly uh, that is going to change tomorrow. My daughter hasn't been taking care of the rabbit very well uh, at either household. She just, uh, she likes to say that she loves it, uh, but she doesn't spend any time with it. She doesn't have, have any effort, uh, put any effort into spending time in, with it or taking care of it, feeding and watering it. Uh, last week when it was upwards of 115 degrees here, uh, she missed multiple days of giving the uh, pet water in which I had to do it. And these are slip ups that you just can't have with something that you're responsible for. I mean, imagine if I just, forgot to uh, take care of my kids or feed them or what have you for a a day, uh, wouldn't go over too well, right? So 
that's her responsibility. And apparently the same sort of behavior is happening at her mom's house and they're done with it. So uh, they're giving the rabbit away to a friend of their, um, uh, my daughter's stepdad, and it is going to be a done deal. I haven't cleaned out that room yet. I'm waiting to hear the official word that this has happened before uh, I actually do it, but it's time. And I don't know what I'm gonna do with that room. Maybe make it into a guest room, get a, um, a guest bed set up uh, kind of situation going. Um, you know, uh, I, there's a number of things I can do with it, but it is not make it smell like a, you know, a rabbit's turd factory, but uh, I'm going to do something with it. And I'm looking forward to uh, gaining part of my house back, which is, which is nice. So that's happening. I feel bad for my daughter. I do because she wants to have that responsibility. She wants to, she wants to love it, but I don't think she understands what love for a pet means. You know, I, even though I try and display this with how I treat my dog and, you know, and what have you, but uh, she doesn't get that. So that's where it is. She's not going to have a pet if she can't take care of it. And I'm not disappointed in this because I think rabbits live a long time. Like this thing would have to go to college with her uh, and because I'm not keeping it <laughs> and I don't think her mom wants it either. So that's a granted that is, you know, six years away, but I think a rabbit could live longer than, uh, than that time period. So that's a, uh, that's the status there. Uh, so all in all, interesting week. And, and I will say this, uh, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. I'll believe it when I see the drops, but it's going to be raining all day and super stoked on that because we need, we need it badly here. And, uh, and the first sign of hope for a positive duck season. I mean, we need a lot more than one or two days of rain to get what we need to pull out, um, uh, you know, flooding at the marshes and everything for the upcoming season. But, uh, but it all starts with one day of rain. So that's the plan. All right, that's what I got going on. Uh, so again, we have Toadies on the program. Uh, let's go ahead and bring in Donnie from Toadies. How's it going, Steve? It is, is good. It Steve? Are you able to? Awesome. Yes, it is. Are you able to turn your camera sideways by chance so get, we get the full screen vision? There we Boom. go. Oh God, you don't Boom. want the full screen version of my 50 year old <laughs> ass, Steve. Trust me, no one does. <laughs> we'll sell more tickets if they can't see me, okay? <laughs> Oh, okay. We'll put up an emoji or something. How's that from back yeah, that 27 years perfect. ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, how yeah. are you doing? Yeah. I'm so sorry that I was, that I'm running late. I had a, I have, I've been working at a, a food bank at home in Amarillo. And today was my last day after like six years, you know, and um, wow. I had to tell everyone bye and stuff like that because we're leaving for tour you know, we start rehearsal this weekend, you know, so I'm really yeah. sorry to be late. I, I appreciate your understanding. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're totally fine. And and that's really awesome. I mean, like, tell me six years at a, at a food bank. I mean, that's what a cool experience to be able to give back in that way. Tell me about that. Oh, uh, it just giving back to people, you know, it's been because uh, my brother, Zach and I, our parents were, you know, they didn't ever really have a lot. They were raised us on love they were hippies you know like ah oh, it's cool we love each other it'll all make a point you know a lot of times we couldn't make rent so you know we had food insecurity as a kid and i figured we knew from early on that um there were good people out there willing to help other people eat and families that deserved it so that's what this has been helping people out it's just it's kind of hard to come home in a bad mood from a job like that. Like, how was your day? Oh, I help people eat. You know what I mean? It's like, it makes you feel good yeah. every day. You know, it's a, it's been a really great place to work, you know? So it, it's not like your normal, whatever, like nine to five job that people go to work at. It's been a hell of a lot more fulfilling. Like, yeah, I helped people eat today. And it's, you know, giving elderly boxes of food that they really, really, really needed, you know, especially, these days a lot of people need a lot of stuff these days yeah. so to it, it's small but a lot of these people rely on it and what we do so it's been really cool you know for me yeah i'm sure it's a great feeling to see like the excitement and appreciation on their face when when they have that because they you know i mean oh, we take yeah. meals for granted sometimes but you know not everybody yeah. has that luxury right so i remember it as a kid i remember our parents weren't able to afford some things so we had to go on 
food stamps, you know what? And they were happy to get it. And then as soon as they could work and they found jobs, then we got off of it. And it's, you can see some people are, uh, they hate to accept this charity, but we're kind of like, it's for what I've been doing, it's dealing with seniors 60 and up. So yeah. it's like, hey man, you you already put into this the past 40 years. So you're just kind of getting your due with taxes and things like that. You've been paying into this. So that's all this is. You're just, you're getting it back, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in kind of your, your story about growing up as well and kind of how, how music ties into that. I mean, your parents, were they able to influence you musically in any way? Like, what oh, was that like? Yeah. Oh, uh, our dad was, uh, my, when I say our, I apologize. My brother, Zach Blair, he's a guitar player and writes against also. He and oh, I nice. are like this. I literally just got off the phone with him. So we talk <laughs> for hours every day, no matter where we are. So it's, he and I always do a lot of the royal we, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh -huh. We're each other's best friends. So, um, but um, our dad was a disc jockey growing up uh, oh, wow. and, and our mom was a florist. So they were creative, but I'll tell you this, disc jockeys and florists did not make a lot of money. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we had a great upbringing. We had a very supportive upbringing. And so our dad would bring records all the time or he would um you know we hear certain stuff on the radio like he would hear uh steely dan like he loved hard rock my mom loved soul and blues you know they met together with steely dan that was okay for them that's where they had some common ground you know or yeah. like if it was something on the radio like uh it, it did, if it was just like uh you know abba or whatever you know my dad would point to uh you know ZZ Top, you know, like cheap sunglasses and go, that is good. And then go to ABBA, that is crap. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was pretty, uh, pretty opinionated, but he also turned us on to like Oingo Boingo, Devo, Zeppelin, The Who. The Who are our favorite band in the world. And we owe that to our dad. Um, we kind of just got a, our, he was our first musical influence. And um, once we decided to become musicians, he said, that's great, but you got to listen to everything, whether you hate it or not, you'll get something from it. So that was our biggest and best, actually lesson we could have ever gotten, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so did you and your brother play instruments together? Did you have a band? Did you start like really latching on together? Yeah. Um, that was always our goal is to play in bands together. Um, I wanted to play drums, but I wasn't any good. So Zach was like, uh, Zach was playing guitar. He said, just play bass. So we taught each other. I, we would sit across, we always shared a room. So we'd sit across from each other's beds and like listen to any Iron Maiden song. I'm like, all right, I learned this. What did you learn? Well, I learned this and show each other. Um, and then our, we just, we always had bands together. And so we started in the early nineties, a band called uh, Hagfish. And we put out a major label record, um, Rock's Your Lame Ass. And that was with uh, Bill Stevenson and Stefan Edgerton. They produced it. And we ended up going around the world quite a few times with that band. And it's kind of how we met everyone, you know, um, uh, through Bill. Uh, we had uh, other bands and that's how Zach ended up in Rise and how I ended up in the Toadies because we would always play on bills together. And we just became friends. and. You know, it was just a it was very weird how it all happened, <laughs> you know, to dip. Oh, wait, can I go blue? Or is this on the radio? Or are we going to go? No, 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 no. You know, be, I can, be yourself. I can go yeah. blue. All right. Just, yeah. um, I mean, I'm not going to go Lenny Bruce or anything, you know, but I'm <laughs> or Carlin or anything. But it's just, you know, we we've always felt like two dipshits from Sherman, Texas, which is like, you know, hour north of Dallas. And we're in up yeah. doing all these things um, through kind of determination and a good amount of luck, you know, but we supported each other through it all. And our parents, our parents knew that we weren't going to get anywhere from college because they couldn't afford it. <laughs> so they were like, yeah. do whatever you want, but just be great at it. Don't, don't be okay. Be great. You know? So, Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really interesting to me because it feels like this dynamic and it's, it's really interesting when you have two siblings that 
are both so great at their their craft, you know, and uh, and go on to do great things and be in the, like in your case in um, in notable monumental bands. Obviously, Rise Against is blew up huge. Uh, the Toadies also, you know, very 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 uh, oh, successful. Yeah. But I mean, the, the odds of that it, feel, it feels like Serena and Venus, Luke and Owen Wilson. What you know? I mean, it's just like yeah. you know how like is it the genes? Is it the parents? What, you know, like, what is it that drive, you think it's a drive there, you know? I think it's both. I think you're there and you're driving each other. And um, I, I think it's uh, like the, the young brothers, you know? Um, Zach and I always loved bands that had brothers in it or, or siblings. We were always, because I mean, so many people, they don't get along with their siblings. And it was just yeah. my brother and I, and it was, we had a close knit family and Zach and I are only 18 months apart. So we're just past the point where you could call us Irish twins, you know? And um, yeah. we've always been each other's, we've always, we always shared rooms. We always shared clothes. We were just been, you know, like I said, we talk every day. All it didn't, he just was in Europe for about a month and a half. Rise just got back from it. That kid still called me every day. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> same thing, Zach. You know, we have to talk every day or it's just kind of like, yeah, I gotta talk to my brother, you know, and it's, I think you, you have this sibling, you know, that's your first fan, your first best friend, your first enemy, all wrapped up in a one. And it's just no one knows those kind of things like your brother and it's, or your sister. And, uh, you know, like you said, the Wilsons, uh, the Youngs, the, the Serena and Venus, you know, they've, you push each other too. Like, it, it doesn't matter what yeah. anyone else thinks, what they think of no. me, you know, or what they think of my playing. If my brother has a problem with my playing or with me, then I got an issue because we can't lie to each other. Like, what did you think? Oh, like, oh shit, really? <laughs> we, you don't lie. Yeah. And you know you can always rely on that person to be 100% honest with you, you know? And I think that's what it, you know, for the rest of your life, you're going to have this person that's going to be just tied to you for as long as you live it, you can rely on to, to give you the straight dope, you know, no matter what, no matter what happens yeah. in your life, no matter how many people blow hot smoke up your ass, you can go to that person and go, is that real smoke? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I'm sure we interviewed your brother like, like 20 years ago or something like, because I remember we interviewed Rise Against like, when they played, I mean, this is well before they, they blew up, but like Slims in San Francisco, I think. Uh, it, yeah, you know right, what? But... Only Crime, we had a band called Only Crime with Bill, and we might have been opening that show. Uh, that was probably where really? Zach got in the band. Uh, they um, oh, really? they uh, had parted ways with Chris Sass, their guitar player, and um, mm -hmm. they, we'd already toured so much together. They knew Zach, they knew his values. They knew his beliefs. They knew that he was a hard worker and they could see every night that he's just an amazing, amazing musician and amazing guitar player. That kid was born to do this. It's like, you know, you see Dave Grohl, like, oh, that guy's born oh, yeah. to do this. That's my brother. Dave Grohl. Yeah. <laughs> right here. I mean, yeah, I'm and big, he's the big nicest fan, so. guy. He's yeah. the nicest yeah. guy. We, uh, yeah. Rise went out and did some dates with them. And my wife and I flew out to see it. And I've also known Chris uh, Shiflet, their guitar player, since No Use days. No Use and Hagfish used to play together all the time. And Chris is another just amazing human being. If you ever get the, the pleasure, to, you know, the opportunity to meet Shiflet, go out of your way. He's an amazing person. Um, but Zach introduced us to Grohl as well. And he was just such a nice guy. You know, all of them are just yeah. incredibly nice people, really good people. But much like that, you can tell, you know, Zach's born to do this as well. You know, he's one of those people that he was just born to it. He saw a video of Pete Townsend when we were young, when I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's great you two have that support for each other. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're lucky. Yeah, so tell me about your your entrance to Toadies, kind of what led to, to that. You joined around 2008 yourself, right? Yeah, um, I was always a huge fan. Um, our band, Hackfish, used to play with them. Uh, sometimes it would be just them and us in the audience watching each other's bands, you know? 
And um, when they got signed, um, they were one of the first bands to get signed at that point in Dallas. And um, just, uh, they were cool, you know, but it was just this band where two guitar, two girl guitar player, or it was Lisa playing bass and their older guitar player was Tracy. And then the singer that would just lean into the mic and scream bloody murder, you know, and we were like, whoa, but their songs were amazing. So then, you know, Rubbernet came out, we bought it. I think, oh God, we started touring 94, 95, Hackfish did, and that's all we listened to was Rubbernet. Then Hell Below came out and that's just, it's a masterpiece. So I've always been a huge fan of the band. So then, you know, I heard that they were getting back together and um, find out through, I found out through MySpace, how old I am and how old this was. <laughs> they were, they were in your a, top eight, right? So <laughs> Yeah, no shit, exactly. <laughs> I messaged them and said, hey, my name's Donnie Blair. You know, like, will you guys go out with me or some of this kind of thing? And uh, turned out, like, I got a message back from the management and I had known the manager forever and went and auditioned. And it was, uh, they were in the middle of making no deliverance at that point. And uh, I was in and out like in 20 minutes, I think. I called my wife before I went in. And then I got back in the car like 25 minutes later and called her. And she goes, uh-oh, that isn't any good. <laughs> I know. Too quick. Uh-oh. But they, I guess they saw what they wanted to see. And they called me the next day and, um, you know, said the gig was mine. And I've been kind of, you know, happier than a pig and shit ever since then. Because I get to play these songs. And see, you know, just from the, the basic, the ba -da, that E chord of PK or Clark introing Tyler or definitely the new songs. I mean, that's just, that's the thing with our new stuff. People seem just as excited about the new stuff, you know, and we've got a new record we're working on now, which is, I can't wait for people to hear it. It's really dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pandemic has been hard on us so it's a pretty dark <laughs> record man and it's, went, went to a dark place <laughs> uh-huh yeah and it's Vaden kind of like leaning into it man and the lyrics on it are just fantastic and just that guy has written some fantastic songs or you know even out doing for him you know so it's uh it's even experiencing that and figuring out how his brain works you know, writing music and writing music with the guys and figuring out, and sometimes not writing music, stepping the hell out of the way, you know, like, all right, I'm just going to play it. You know, I'm not yeah. going to put in my two because sometimes they don't need another cook in that kitchen. Sometimes that's not needed, you know, but the thing with them, and especially with Vaden in particular, he's very, very, very great about, hey, what do you got? You got an idea? Or do you have anything for this? No. Okay. Well, if you do, let me know. It's a really great open atmosphere, you know. So it's uh, yeah. playing, but playing the songs every night, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to. And just playing with the guys because it's just, uh, you know, we're we're all in our middle fifties, but ah, damn, I, I still think we know how to we know how to do it. Did, I mean, get out there. And we rock. have Mark yeah. Resnicek, dude. We have Mark Resnicek as a yeah. drummer. He's the best drummer in rock, hands down. So what are you gonna yeah. do? <laughs> we gotta follow yeah. that guy we can't suck if you have him in your him in your band you he, can't suck he, you gotta be good <laughs> he sets that bar you know? for sure so oh my yeah. god yeah they're totally oh he's the best man that's he's, it's such a treat to play with him yeah and so so you said you uh, came in when they were recording no deliverance did were you a part of that album or did you kind of come in at the tail end and just play live at first like yeah, no, I didn't. They pretty much had that one done. Um, Baden was doing the vocals for that. And then uh, after that, they did Feeler. Feeler was half of, like, the majority of Feeler <clears throat> was basically Hell Below Stars Above. They had already done this record called Feeler, right? And that was going to be the, the record after Rubberneck. Um, for some reason, the label didn't like it. So they made them go back and they redid Hell Below Stars Above, you know? And so yeah, they wanted, it was kind of like them going, you know what? We think this record needs to be out. We think people need to hear this record. We believe in it. So those three guys, they were the ones that had made Feeler also. Of course, Lisa was on the original Feeler, but she wouldn't have been anymore. So they were like, we're going to go make this record. We have to do it with the three of us. It would have been 
weird to bring in a, a, a different person that wasn't in the band at that point. I wasn't going to have the same ideas and stuff. You know what I mean? So my first record was uh, play rock music. Sure, sure. And and so that that feeler album being shelved and uh, and kind of put on hold, like what was the what was the experience around that? And I mean, you, you said they like they had to put it out, right? Like, so it took a took a while for them to be able to revisit the, that re, and you had to re-record the songs, right? And everything because yeah. you didn't have access to the to the the, the tracks you weren't in your scope oh. wouldn't give them to you, right? So yeah. yeah. Oh so, no. So they had to re they got licensed to do it from Interscope. It was just one of those of yeah, we could put out a brand new record of music, but we feel very strongly about, they could have said, ah, we'll just leave that in the vaults and no one will ever hear it. But they were like, no, let's redo this. Let's, people need to hear this. And they were right. It's an awesome record. I love a lot of those songs. And there's still even quite a few songs left over from that that are fantastic that people haven't heard, you know, but yeah. I have and they're pretty badass. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've even told them, I've said, I know you guys went through a lot of horse shit to make Hell Below, but if that's what you had to do to make that record, I'm cool with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what a, what a path Records to get there, me. right? I mean, oh my God, it's such a, it's just a classic record. I, I fucking love that record so much, you know? Yeah, it, but it feels great to play, you know, some of those songs live too, right? Like, I mean, those ones it that is. you're really into. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. I don't yeah. think, yeah, you know, Baden and those guys haven't written one song that I don't like, you know, that I'm not excited to go and play, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's cool. And just to, the four of us to go up there and do this shit at night after night and still do it well and believe in it. Like, wow. And then here, the new stuff that we're doing, like, okay, none of this is rehashed whatsoever. And some bands our age, they want to just give people that sound. Because that's what they want. They know people want. We have no option. That's just the sound of our band. You know, it's like, it's just what happens. Yeah. You know, we're not going to come up with a, a pop radio hit in the style of something else. Like, no, nah, we're going to come up with something that's catchy, but it's, you know, it's going to be really weird and off time and it's going to stick in your head and it's going to, piss you off that it's so weird and it sticks in your head <laughs> you know yeah yeah um you guys opened for red hot chili peppers at some point too tell me uh tell me about that i don't i wasn't there during that you weren't there um, okay. they've got some good they said that the peppers are really nice guys to them you know and just um really cool i don't know who they're able to hang out with i think they hung out with I think Rez was telling me Chad Smith and Navarro a lot. They were the guys that they yeah. pretty much hung out with a bunch. It was the, whenever Navarro was in the band, you know? Yeah. And they said yeah, they yeah. were super cool to him, you know? And they gave him whatever they needed. They were super. I mean, they've, they've got a lot of cool stories about that point in time. But some of it's not for children. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of really cool stories that I like to hear. Like, wow, that's cool as shit, you know? Yeah. What are, what are some of your stories, like maybe memorable fan experiences that you've had, you know, uh, people that connect to these songs that, uh, that you're able to play? And, and obviously that have maybe led to the idea of bringing this album back and playing it in its entirety. Oh, um, I, it's, it's seeing the joy on people's face that never goes out. We, we get asked, like, I'm sure you guys are tired of playing Possum Kingdom and Tyler. Like, no, we're not. How the hell can you get tired of playing a song that from the opening chords of it, people lose their minds and start and just the entire place goes bat shit or a simple, you know, ba -da 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 -da, and then watch, you know, 6,000 people go bat shit crazy over that. Yeah, yeah not many bands have that opportunity not many bands have that um they don't have those songs in their list to do that you know people they wait till they get to the chorus you know it's not the intro of the damn song that makes people lose their shit and then they're that way from that point on it's you know oh dang it are you there i hit something i apologize yeah. it's um oh yeah you're good. Entire, you. it's the entire record that people love and it's just um watching that that uh joy on people's face they're so excited to see that done and 
there's pressure on us to do it right and not just blow through it. I mean, we're really working on it. We want to make sure the tempos are right. We're playing the right instruments. We're playing, we're doing this right. We're doing that right. So we're, we really work hard to do it correctly because people expect it. They're paying good money to see us do this. So we don't take it lightly. You know, we never have and never will. And yeah. You know, it, talking to the fans, people have used um, Tyler as their wedding song. I mean, well, okay, if you listen to the lyrics, but okay, that's very sweet, but listen to the lyrics. Um, you know, or they just, it means you know, people getting the lyrics tattooed on them, you know, getting Toadies tattoos. Yeah. And, and I get it. I'm a fan of the band too. You know, like, well, I, I totally get it. You know, I'm one of you guys. I just snuck yeah. in. You know, they haven't. Yeah, I got in the back door and they just didn't figure it out yet, you know. <laughs> you, you got a backstage pass, you get to you just wander on yeah. stage at every show. It's good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're just like, well, who the hell is this guy? He's been here every day for like since 2008. Get rid of this. He just shows show. up, but I, you know, we have to oh, we have to pay him. Oh, okay. We have to we have we're paying we have, pay we have him? to visit that, you know. <laughs> Why the hell did we start paying him? He just shows up with his face, you know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, pick it up. <laughs> But Whatever. you, but you guys started the, you started the rubberneck shows before COVID hit. Obviously, you had to pause it from there. You were mid, mid this tour, and then the tour obviously had some bumps, you know, to get to the point where you're kind of going back out now. And so, I mean, first off, how were those initial shows? Um, I mean, you told me about the energy, obviously, of these songs, but um, and then also kind of as you're gearing up to the, for the next chapter, does it feel just as natural to, to pick it back up a couple years later? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, we we took about a year and a half two years off from mm -hmm. gosh i don't think we met we did one show at the end of december 2019 and we weren't even in the same room together until last october i believe and it mm -hmm. was weird you know um like everyone we were wondering what was going to happen with everything you know and now it, it feels more natural and it was the cool thing about it and this is why i love my band members we had been to, we hadn't been in the same room for two years you know at all we had just talked yeah. with each other and i think within 10 minutes we could have played a show literally like we were just practicing and going yeah. over stuff and it was just such a it's a really cool loose vibe that we have with each other and tightness but i was amazed i was really worried like crap i hope i hope we can play we sound okay we could have gone and done a show that night. It would have been easy. Like, oh, well, I guess we're doing this shit again. All right, well, this works, you know. So we've been playing shows the past year and it's, which is good because, you know, now we're, I feel really warmed up, you know, we're, I, I, and I think by the end of this tour, we're going to be really at the top of our game to kind of go in and get the record done. Because I think we're going to, we're going to meet with Steve Albini on this tour as well in uh, Chicago and, discuss hopefully making a record with him you know which oh, oh, nice. we're okay. pretty excited about you know because we kind of want to go make a record um playing you know we're, we're we've done the pro tools thing and how studios are and then you know we we keep saying we want to get the sound of our band not our band making sounds you know we've yeah. done that but let, let's do something different let's do something where we're playing you know so people can hear that the real sound of the band, you know, not, I mean, anyone can kind of go in and you can make a great record these days with anything, you know, but let's prove it that, you know, it's when bands go in and actually do stuff where they're playing. That's what I love to listen to. Mistakes and all. You know? Yeah. Mistakes and all. Yeah. And you're coming to the Bay Area. You're going to play uh, in SAC, Ace of Spades, and then in San Francisco, Regency. Uh, and, yeah. Um, and Regency is a great place. My favorite concert ever actually was there. It, what uh, was it? Yeah, it was uh, 2017, a, D a David Bowie celebration um, oh, led by nice. Gary Oldman. Yeah, Gary Oldman, the actor uh, and, nice. and friends, right? So there were like 70 musicians. It was like three and a half hours of, of Bowie, you know, musicians feeding in and out. And we got to interview Oldman and a bunch of other people, you know, people who are in Bowie's band. Yeah, uh, you know, it's you're a Bowie fan, people. then. You're. A I Bowie mean, fan? I I definitely because I've been a Bowie fan, but that evening definitely solidified for me. Uh, but awesome. even before that, actually, the year before Bowie, but I I 
I think a year that year and the year after I went uh, to Halloween as David Bowie. So <laughs> our, our uh, drummer, so he it's, his from, favorite person on the planet. He loves it. We actually yeah. did next week. We're releasing a quick EP, a digital EP of uh, songs that we had from our last ra- uh, uh, record session. Um, uh-huh. I, I, we're calling it Damn You All to Hell. It works. For, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We have a we have a Bowie cover on there of Sound and Vision, and that's going to be out. And it's it's probably songs we'll never play live, you know. But it's just stuff that we listen to. We're like, we Res has been saying forever, we should release this. So we're releasing it. It's like four or five songs on it, and Sound and Vision's on there. And it's I love it. It sounds so cool. It's such a cool version of it that we did. You know, I can't wait for people to hear it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely check that out. Um, yeah, so Regency is great. Uh, but, but I'm stoked. What's a memorable I love show? Oh. Go ahead, please continue. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what do you love about it? What, what's a memorable time you had in the city? I think, come, again, coming from dipshit North Texas, everything was just, golly, we're in San Francisco, <laughs> you know, so everything was just wide eyed. But I was going to San Francisco. I still feel that sense of enjoyment and joy. It's not like a lot of California towns, you know? I mean, it's just, uh, there's so much freedom, you know, you, you're not looked down upon for anything. You can be who you want to be, what you want to be, how you want to be there. You know, it doesn't matter. And I think the minute we rolled in, that's, what it was and we loved it we had actually hagfish once we were on um god i think it was a tour with might have been everclear and we had driven from um los angeles the night before and we had to drive all night to get up to san francisco and i woken up and we drove literally and i think this is 96 into the the biggest uh pride parade in san francisco and we were like uh-huh. rad uh-huh. <laughs> we just pulled over and then just hung out and watched the parade all day long and it was just i mean coming from texas you know it was so badass to see that to see all these people being who they wanted to be all together and they were happy they were they just yeah. had joy to be like this is me and i'm around a lot of other people that want to be how they are and with with no judgment with no uh no anything and it was just fantastic to see that you know i mean there's punkers there's there's anyone that you know there's all kinds of stuff and i think that's just that mixed with just the beauty of the terrain and just the city itself you know i've just always loved it there i'm stoked that we're going to be there i can't wait yeah 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 that's awesome um and so I want to hear about Dark Seeker Coffee, uh, how that came about. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, I'm a coffee nerd. Um, well, I used to be, uh, started working at Starbucks like in 2004, and I hated uh-huh. coffee. I couldn't do it. But <laughs> opening there, I had to be there at, I think, five in the morning, you know? So I started just doing uh-huh. shots of espresso, you know? And that turned into coffee. And I've gotten all of the band to be coffee drinkers. Uh, Clark has gone one more. Clark is an espresso aficionado. He's very, 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 our guitar player, Clark Vogler, who actually lives north of uh, San Francisco. Oh, he's, a, he's a Northern California guy. He lives there. Loves it. He'll never move. Like, hey, you're going to move to Texas? He's like, <laughs> no. You know, I don't blame no. him. We're like, hey, can we come live with you then? Um, anyway, uh, he, uh, he loves espresso and he loves cappuccino. It's a good cappuccino and a good latte. So that's kind of, he and I go and look for great cafes. He's even bringing this, uh, special cappuccino, like, uh, espresso maker for the tour so we can have good espresso uh-huh, really? every day. So we got into, um, I started thinking about like the band had, um, uh, we had the, uh, gosh box, box slider beer we had you know all the the different beers with uh, martin house i don't drink beer i'm a straight edge hardcore kid you know i don't i never i don't yeah. mind anyone that, that that you know imbibes or anything that's fantastic but it never was me so i was like well i like coffee 
let's look into making a coffee. So we found this fantastic guy, uh, Mike, at Full City Rooster. And I started thinking of, I didn't want to just do some beans and then put a Toadies label on it. Big deal. So the first yeah, one we yeah. did was a, te- a Toadies Southern Pecan uh, in Texas. I don't know if you've ever had Southern Pecan coffee. Mm-hmm. It's, so. it's amazing. Uh, there's a great place, uh, Green, Texas, at the Green Hall. You can get this specific pecan coffee from there. And um, I was like, well, let's just try that. Mike one up me and grabbed real, he got a bunch of specific Texas real Southern pecans and ground them up into the beans, like in the roasting process. So you can taste wow. that Southern pecan in it. And it did real yeah. well. So then we kind of thought of like, well, let's, let's try another one. And I had a lot of my hands to do in that last one. And, I, and Mike, Mike has his own, he literally goes out to the Catalina wine mixer and does tastings literally the fucking wow. catalina wine mixer <laughs> yeah, he yeah. Does, uh, tastings for people that's what he does he's he flies all over the world to do uh coffee for people he's so i'm like well you know it's kind of like getting jimmy hendrix in your band and making him play rhythm guitar so i was like what do you want to do mike what are you excited about yeah. he goes, okay glad you asked there's this, you know, this African bean that I want to, it's dark. That's what I want to do. I want to use that. So we went with that and we all sampled it. And it was just a great bean. We love the coffee. And then we just kind of worked on the, 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 you know, kind of like, well, dark secret would be cool, you know? So let's, it's kind of fun doing that stuff to figure out what we have that works with the band that we can name something as well, you know? It's not yeah. like we're going to yeah, that, call it, you know, Jigsaw Girl Coca-Cola or something like that. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Rubberneck hot dogs. I don't think that would really work. You got to <laughs> figure it out right there. That's you know. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you never know. We'll try it. We'll see. <laughs> it could work, you know. Uh, you never know, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I wanted to ask you also, Elliot Smith, did you get a chance to record with him? We didn't. Um, I didn't. Uh, I uh, And Clark, I think when the guys were gone, they had just left. And I think Rob uh, brought Elliot in specifically for that. And yeah. Clark is really uh, bummed out that he didn't get to meet him. He's still kind of pissed off that uh, that he was there after Clark had left. And I think Rob did that. He asked everyone like, hey, can I bring in Elliot Smith? And they were like, oh, hell yes. You know, cause Rob Schnaff, who was the producer. He's one of our producers on quite a few records and a great guy, great producer too. Um, his wife was managing Elliot and he was his producer too. And I think Elliot was a, a fan of the Toadies at that time too. So it's just kind of a, it's nice to have, have had him on yeah. there, you know? You know, I I was like, oh wow, that's cool that they have him on that. You know, anything that record. You know, yeah, yeah. I guess that was two thousand one, so I guess I was before you you joined, right? So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so t- tell me about the Dia de los Todes uh, festival that you guys have done, and is that going to come back again? What are your? I mean, is that you you did that for ten years straight, and I know we yeah. had COVID and kind of a break and everything. Yeah, we don't know. Um, we would, it was, it was so awesome to put together to just feature bands we loved, you know, but it's, it's, mm-hmm. it was one of those things where we were putting so much time into it that we were all getting a little overworked and just wanted to kind of take a breather and step back and maybe rethink it, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm sure like Mike, you know, Briquette, you know, from, uh, from No Effects, sometimes I'm sure Punk and Drublick is a big deal. You know, that's a lot. Oh, yeah. of, and then again, he probably learned from Kevin Lyman a lot on how to do that stuff. And Mike's no idiot. Mike's a smart guy, you know. Um, but it's it's one of those things of a lot of that stuff takes a lot out of you, man. It really does. And you want to give people the best show you can. And so I think it, it's one of those things that we'll have to talk about if we want to do it again. And I think if so, then we want to make it amazing and how to do that who to do that with where and when you know so it's we've talked about taking it like on the road doing a touring thing but again how 
So that's it's a great question, though. Great a lot question. of work, and yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. Fantastic question, though. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so December thirtieth is is the Toadies Day, right? And so, like, yeah. what does it mean to you to have a have a day in Fort Worth like that is that is yours? It's fantastic. It's every day we go in and we congratulate each other on Happy Toadies Day. You know. <laughs> If we do, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're kind of morons. <laughs> like, happy Toadies Day. Oh, happy Toadies Day to you. Well, happy Toadies Day to you too, you know? So, but it's just also cool because it's always, in, uh, we always get to play Billy Bob's and it's just always so much fun. You know, the place is always packed when we play and it's just a, it's kind of a cool feeling to walk in and have, you know, have so many people at that place and just have them, have so much fun and you're the reason you know and just being in town that day it's kind of a different it's not like everyone's happy like they the kids wake up and it's like oh it's my toadies day present what do i get <laughs> holiday you know. from school right yeah. oh wow you know there's some oh. weird version of santa that gives kids you know severed limbs or something from the jigsaw girl i don't know but <laughs> you know um well, they are out of school i guess anyway because it is it's the holidays so <laughs> but already happy exactly but it is yeah. a fun thing it was really a nice honor that they gave us you know that they that they felt that we were a big enough contributor to fort worth and bringing people in that they would honor us with that so in being texans from dfw it's kind of it's a really cool thing to walk in and like not again not many people have that you know, it's, it's a cool thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so as I look forward, you got the tour, you then you're in, you're going to be working on the album more. Uh, I mean, you're thinking like early next year for the album. What does that look like for your timeline? Well, that's, well, that's what we're going to go talk to Steve about. Um, we're going to meet up with him in a few weeks when we're in Chicago, see his availability. And then, you know, there's still some more songs we want to write. We're going to be playing new songs every night, actually. This is the best way to see what yeah. works and what doesn't work. Like, oh, that part did not work. We should rethink that. Or that song was amazing. People loved it. Let's keep it. You know, it's kind of a great lab that we have at our disposal. Yeah. And we're going to be working on new stuff at sound checks backstage. You know, we're really excited about it, you know, to go out and try this stuff out. You know, well, it'll be you know, during the set, um, and we'll be warmed up and just, we've already done one. Uh, we played a couple of shows a few weeks ago called the charmer and it got a really good response every night. There's some live, there's a YouTube stuff. I've, I found out and I wanted to look at it to go, okay, let's just, God, I hope this came out good. And then you listen to it and go, oh shit, it sounds cool. All right. They're one down. <laughs> We have one yeah. song down, you know, so uh, it's it's a great way. The, the crowd doesn't lie. They're either stoked or they aren't, you know, and that's why it's the best thing to go out and play new shit on stage to see instead of just yeah. break it out on everyone. You know, that way you get you can really tune it up if you need to. Yeah, yeah, no, well, it's it's great that you're doing that and and playing the album in its entirety because I mean those album, full album shows when a band does that it's it's kind of like you're at something special and I, I mean and I've been yeah. to a number of shows where they do the full album I mean this one right here um, is and everything in transit uh, Andrew McMahon uh, from Jack's Mannequins nice. you know album. yeah and that's yeah. an album nice. that's an album that con that album connected so much to me personally you know and. And for the 10th anniversary of it, he did, you know, played it from beginning to end and for a whole tour. And it's just like wow. this, every song clicks and it's, and I know it's kind of the same for, uh, for you with, you know, with the fans and, and what that yep. album means to them. Right. So, yeah. And that's why we take it very seriously. We want to make sure that we do it right. We don't, we don't want to do it how the band does it now. We want to do it how you're used to hearing it, you know, because uh, yeah you don't pay to go see like a long instrumental jam in the middle of PK and bring it down and then bring it up. No one wants to hear that. They want to hear the song as it was recorded. They've been listening to it for 30 years, you know, and we know that, you know, we say that stuff for the other songs, but the stuff it's, we take it very seriously. People want to hear it done right. You know, and we're, we're sticklers for that crap. You know, at the yeah. toadies, we at the toadies yeah. care. 
Uh, <laughs> I like it. You, 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 put, you put the I care sticker on the, on the album and you're like, that's what matters, right? So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. It's awesome. It's awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Donnie, I want to thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Hey, thank and, you, Steve. Uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to make it out to one of your uh, shows out here on the on when you get to the West Coast too. I know in a couple of weeks, so it'll be Let great to know. see you Come live. So. Any of them, love to meet you in person. Come out to anything. Just please blow us up. We'd love to meet you and see what you think. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you have a great rest of your day then. And, you uh, as well, and Steve. Good luck with Thank the tour you. as you get out there, okay? I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, man. You have a good one. That was my interview with Toadies here on Concert Pipeline. And that takes us to the final segment on the program, the music news. Got a couple of stories to wind out the program here today. Uh, the first being one that is very close to my heart and uh, to this program. I mean, this whole wall is uh, is featuring this uh, this artist we're about to talk about, uh, and that is Andrew McMahon. We just did a, a, an episode. My buddy Joe, uh, his wife, and I uh, did a sh an episode where we talked about the Andrew McMahon in the Wilderness and Dashboard Confessional Show, which is featured in my uh, shadow box I made right here. Um, uh, that show, we did a whole show about it. Well, a couple of dates later, Andrew McMahon made it home uh, to Orange County and he celebrated his 40th uh, birthday, um, which had happened just a couple of days prior, actually the day before um, the, show, the San Francisco show was his 40th birthday, but he wanted to, wanted to celebrate it down south. And there were some reasons for that. Um, he brought something corporate back together for the first time in 12 years. Um, he and that's something corporate was his first band uh, that he that he had with Josh Partington, Clutch, uh, Brian Ireland, uh, and they even had William Tell, uh, who had uh, um, quit the band before the band actually uh, fully uh, dissolved. And uh, they were all back together, uh, and they played six something corporate songs. Uh, which was a really cool. Andrew McMahon announced it on um, Instagram through a story because he had like a hundred tickets left to sell and the show sold out um, once, uh, uh, once he announced a something corporate reunion. So um, a great way to celebrate his birthday. Uh, and uh, they, I mean, I was truly impressed when I saw that they actually did six songs and not just, uh, not just one song, but uh, but they were uh, they were able to to play a handful of songs together. They did not. Uh, Andrew McMahon, in an interview with Alternative Press, noted that um, it. I mean, it wouldn't likely lead to a tour or anything along those lines. Um, I mean, as they all have very separate lives, and um, all of the other members have you know their own jobs and careers. So, uh, so that is not not likely to happen. But. Uh, but the, but it was super cool, super cool to have that reunion. I wish I could have been there uh, at that show. Um, all right, it was the first show. I mean, that's the first story. Uh, second up, there's no segue here. Uh, R. Kelly was convicted on six counts of child pornography and sexual abuse. Uh, the disgraced singer's co-defendants who were accused of covering Kelly's notorious history were acquitted. Um, and uh the, that was six out of 13 counts of the child pornography and sexual abuse uh, so uh that includes producing child pornography conspiracy to produce child pornography conspiracy to receive child pornography enticing of a minor to engage in criminal sexual activity and conspiracy to obstruct justice uh so things are not going too well for him um each uh each charge carries a sentence of up to 20 years of uh child pornography charge of 20 years with each enticement charge carries a sentence of up to 10 years he's going to be bar behind bars for a while it uh it sounds like um and the verdict took place in chicago occurred 11 hours over uh, after 11 hours over two days of deliberation by jurors it was a culmination of a five-week trial where five women testified uh, regarding accounts of sexual abuse by Kelly whilst they had been underage. Um, and we don't get, need to get into all the details other than um, he's, you know, he's going to be uh, behind bars for a while. So not going to be flying away from that one, are you, Kelly? 
Um, let's go from R. Kelly to Kanye West. Uh, title of this article on Rolling Stone is What the Hell is Going On at Kanye West's Mysterious New Private School? Uh, and his latest ambitious venture, maybe his most surprising and most mysterious. Uh, uh, over the past decade, he cemented himself not only as a musical force, but also as a cultural and creative visionary with the launch of his Yeezy line, major collaborations with Adidas and Gap, and tech projects like the STEM player. Uh, and so now he's moving on to education uh, with Donda Academy, his own private school named after his late mother, Professor Donda West, uh, headquartered in Simi Valley. Uh, the tuition-based uh, Christian prep school's mission, according to its website, is to prepare students to become the next generation of leaders through an ethic of integrity and care. Uh, and uh, so he returned to Instagram earlier this month to share photos of students decked out in school uniforms with his designs, of course. Uh, and he complained about his four children uh, not attending the school, seemingly suggesting to his strange wife, Kim Kardashian, the kids should split their time between Donda and their current school. Yes. That is the thing you want to do to kids: make them attend two different schools, uh, you know, so that they have to split their lives up and have all sort of uh, chaos. Right? It's hard enough when you have a split household and um, and have to split time. It's hard enough to make that work. Um, I am able to make that work with my kids' my mother. We do uh, I, what I would say is a pretty good job with uh, with our kids and um, and our kids working through you know that co-parenting situation, but actually taking them out of school for half the time, that doesn't seem like a, a, a good idea. Not my decision though. Uh, but so uh, they, West has plans to open up campuses across the country uh, uh, alongside Adonda University. Uh, the school has shared little information about its academics beyond what's on its sparse website. And anomaly when compared to the area's top private schools that detail their staff, classes and other programs. Uh, the Academy's website merely notes that students' daily schedules include full school worship, core classes of language, arts, uh, math, and science, lunch and recess and, uh, enrichment courses, including world, world language, visual art, film, choir, and parkour. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, parents must sign an, uh, an informal agreement, apparently. Uh, the school is not yet accredited. Uh, and was still looking to hire instructors shortly before the school year began. Um, exactly who attends and works at the school has been tricky to pin down. Uh, there's not a lot of information about, about it, hence the title of this article, What the Hell is Going On? And it has done to get, uh, school that he, uh, he has made. So, and a representative for West uh, did not respond to a request for comments. There's no idea what's going on at, uh, at that school. Um, all right. Uh, so we're going to uh, close out with one more story here. Uh, and of course, in true uh, fashion, uh, it's going to be about the Foo Fighters. Uh, the Foo Fighters have announced a new greatest hits album, The Essential Foo Fighters. It's a compilation that features hits uh, from across the band's career and follows their greatest hits LP from 2009. Uh, so um, let's see here. The new album is due for release on October 28th via Sony Music. And... Uh, it's available on CD and double vinyl, features 19 tracks on CD with two extra songs, Breakout and Waiting on a War on the LP. Um, the career spanning collection features the biggest songs from the band's career, including two versions of Everlong alongside My Hero, Best of You, Monkey Wrench, and more. Uh, you can pre-order the album. Um, it has, let's see, Making a Fire, Times Like These, Rope, um, Cold Day in the Sun, Big Me, Long Road to Ruin, Shame Shame, Best of You, uh, All My Life, Pretender, uh, or the, the Pretender, This is a Call, Walk, Learn to Fly, The Sky is a Neighborhood, um, Breakout, available on vinyl these days, and then, of course, closing with Everlong, uh, like their, their live set, right, an acoustic version of Everlong. So um, they, uh, yeah, they got a Best of coming out. And that's uh, that's the latest on the on the Foo Fighters. So good good times there. Look forward to checking that out. Um, that is our show for today. Uh, next time on the program we have uh, Impelitary. Uh, that's right. I had a chance to talk to uh, Chris Impelitary and Rob Rock from uh, from the band Impelitary uh, and uh, about their their band, their storied career, and so much more. So that's all coming up next time on Concert Pipeline. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, uh, like the uh, the podcast, subscribe to it, 
hit it up on all the social medias. Uh, that, I mean, really, Facebook and Instagram are the main ones that uh, that we use. Uh, and um, you know, and tell your friends um, to to, uh, to like it as well. Leave comments, uh, positive reviews on the Apple, you know, uh, podcast. All that fun stuff really helps us. So thank you. I don't thank you enough for that. So um, appreciate it. Uh, and for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.